All right, so what I have here is a, what is intended to be a gyro compass. It will use um, precession caused by the Earth's rotation to find geographic north. Um, it consists of a flywheel that's inside a paper cowling. The paper protects the apparatus from air current generated by the flywheel, and then a motor to drive the flywheel and a battery pack for the motor. This is all sitting in a boat made out of a Tupperware container and a piece of steel and some aluminum brackets. And it's sitting in water, floating in water. And <clears throat> then there's a, a wire coat hanger here and a twist tie going through a collar with a metal washer in the middle. So the whole thing can freely uh, pivot in the horizontal plane with very little friction. The friction is just due to the viscosity of the water and the contact point here and the air. So, oh, and um, so right now what it's doing is it's settling into its magnetic equilibrium. There is a magnet in the motor and that responds to the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the magnet is oriented so that it's north pole points this way. And so what I've done is I've put two permanent magnets on the other side of the boat with their north pole in the opposite direction. And just experimentally, I determined that with two of those particular uh, small permanent magnets, it comes close to balancing out the magnetic force. It's not perfect, uh, but it's close enough that the gyro compass effect dominates while the motor is running. So what I want to do first is just let it reach its magnetic equilibrium point. It's kind of turning back and forth right now as it tries to find it because I just put the boat into the water. Um, and so in this video, what I'm going to do is just speed up the footage uh, until to, as it reaches equilibrium. I think it's reached magnetic equilibrium, pointing around 280 degrees. So now I'm going to go ahead and start the motor. Now as the motor spins up, the boat starts to turn because the flywheel is not perfectly vertical, so it has some horizontal rotation, and then due to conservation of momentum, increase in horizontal rotation for the flywheel will lead to spin in the opposite direction for the boat. But that's only while it's accelerating while it's speeding up. Once the flywheel reaches its maximum speed, which should be more or less constant during the run of the experiment, so long as the charge in the batteries remains mostly constant, then that effect will disappear and it'll just uh, it, it'll start doing the gyro compass effect. So, once again, I'm going to let this go, and I'm actually going to let it run for an hour, and I'll speed up the footage of it uh, finding its new equilibrium point.
Alright, so it's been running for about an hour, and I can see it's still sort of oscillating back and forth, um, and that's what it seems to usually do. It never completely settles down to just one position. Um, so now what I'm going to do is turn off the motor so we can see it settle down to the non-spinning equilibrium. <clears throat> and just like when I started it up, uh, as the motor spins down, the boat spins as well due to conservation of angular momentum. Essentially, it's transferring its momentum to the boat through the friction in the bearings. Adjusting the collar so it's a little bit further away from the edge. And now I'm going to give it another five minutes to come to equilibrium. Okay, and so now it's Looks like it's pretty stably returned to its magnetic equilibrium. It's moving a little bit now just because I just opened the door and that causes air currents in here. But, so that's the, the demonstration of the gyro compass behavior. Um, I'm just gonna take the camera down from the mount here so you can get a slightly better look at the apparatus. Can get it in, so yeah, I don't know if I can really capture it well, but you see there's the boat, the collar above it. Come a little bit closer on the boat. All right, so now I want to talk a bit about the theory of the gyro compass. The gyro compass uses the phenomenon of precession, so it's important to make sure you're completely comfortable with precession. So let's start there. Precession refers to a change in an object's spin axis. And a common source of change in precession, change in spin axis is a torque, an external torque. So if we imagine that we have an object that's spinning about a particular axis and we apply a torque. So here, imagining a torque that tries to turn the top going away and the bottom coming toward you that will cause the axis around which the object is spinning to turn, to process, in the way indicated in red here. The axis will tilt to the left. This might be a little bit surprising because naively you might expect the axis to simply tilt away from the away from you at the top because that's the direction in which the torque is applied, but that's not what happens. Another example, uh, a more common example, is a spinning top. So imagine we have a top and it's spinning clockwise, clockwise from above. If we look at the forces on this top, there is its weight, which we can think of as being applied at the center of mass, and the point of contact. The weight pulls down, the contact pushes up, but they don't go through the same point if the top is leaning over as it is in this diagram. As a result, there's a torque trying to tilt the top further over. And if the top wasn't spinning, it would simply fall over to the right due to this torque. But because the top is spinning, what we observe is that the axis changes. It processes and the top here will then move toward you uh, 
as things are shown in this diagram. Now that then results in the visible wobble of the top because when the axis tilts toward you, the torque caused by the imbalance in weight shifts its location. So the direction in which the axis processes changes as the top moves around in its wobble and, and thus goes around in a circle. So let's zoom in and try to understand why this happens. So here we're looking at a close-up of the top and we're looking at the, the downhill side of it. So it's tilted toward you and it's still spinning uh, clockwise. If we focus on just this one point, what are the forces acting there? Well, it has a certain weight and it's also being supported by the structure around it, but the support is less than the weight. That's why, again, if the top were not spinning, it would fall toward you. There's a net force in the down direction on that point. But the top is spinning. So that point is moving to the left with a certain velocity. And like all objects that have a velocity, when you apply a force, their velocity changes. It doesn't instantly start moving in the direction in which the force is applied. So the new velocity of that point as a result of the downward force is down and to the left. But if that point travels down and to the left, then that means that the spin is now tilted over to the left of the entire top. The axis similarly is tilted to the left relative to the old spin axis, and that's what we call precession. Again, since the direction in which the top is leaning will change over time, you observe a wobble as this leftward motion at the downhill side changes which direction that is, going around in a circle again. Now, this a technique of analyzing individual points is intuitive and effective, but somewhat cumbersome. So there's a better way to think about precession. So let's again return to the top spinning clockwise as it is here. It's spinning about a particular axis. We can represent that spin using a vector. A vector is just a direction and magnitude. And we'll put the vector along the spin axis and then use its magnitude, its size, to indicate how fast the object is spinning. But which way do we point the vector, up or down here? Well, conventionally we use the right-hand rule. To use the right-hand rule, you curl your fingers in the direction of rotation and your thumb points in the direction that will be the, the vector that's used to represent that rotation. In this example, because it's spinning clockwise, when you curl your fingers in the direction of rotation, your right thumb will point down. So we use the down vector here along the spin axis to represent that rotation. And once we've recorded, once we've represented the spin as a vector, as a vector there's no need to retain the, the thing that was showing the linear motion. So now let's look at the forces again. They were out of balance, causing a torque. We represent that as a vector pointing away from you. Again, right-hand rule, curl your fingers in the direction of the torque shown here, and your right thumb will point away from you. So again, we can get rid of all that and just leave the vectors. Finally, this torque-induced precession can be summarized with the simple rule, spin follows torque. Wherever the spin is, it tries to move toward the torque that is applied. Since the torque is pointed away from you, the spin vector tries to move away from you, so that's the bottom of the top trying to move away, hence the top of the top comes toward you. And so this simple rule is all you need to remember for precession caused by torque. However, it's even easier than that because it's simply an analog of Newton's second law. So first let's review Newton's second law of motion for translational motion, velocity follows force. If you have an object, that's initially not moving, 
and you apply a force. And after a certain period of time, it will be moving with some velocity in the same direction as that applied force. But if you have an object that's initially moving, you apply that same force as before, it does not instantly start moving in the direction of the applied force. It has a change in velocity that incorporates its old, its old velocity plus the applied force. And if you wait a long enough time and apply a constant force during that time, eventually the velocity will point in the same direction as the force. But it doesn't happen immediately. And of course, there's a quantitative version of Newton's second law, but I don't need that here, so I'm going to skip over it. The same principle applies to spin, and we have the rule spin follows torque. If I have an object that is initially not rotating, and I apply a torque, then after a while, the object will be spinning in the same direction as the applied torque. But if I have an object that's already spinning, and I apply a torque, then it does not instantly start spinning in that direction. Instead, its spin gradually changes to align with the applied torque. And that's what we call precession. This too, of course, has a quantitative version. So you can remember everything you need to know about precession just by remembering that it's the analog of Newton's second law applied to rotating objects. Okay, now before we get to the gyro compass, there's one more thing you need to talk about, which is forces on an object that's a passenger of another object. Since we're going to be talking about what happens to objects on Earth and Earth is moving, uh, it's sometimes difficult to think about those forces because it's, it's sort of weird to think about the Earth as, as moving. So let's uh, just review how this how it works when you have something, one object riding on another. So let's imagine that I'm standing on a bridge and there's a train going by with some velocity. If I jump down onto that train and I grab a hold of it, then the train will apply a force to me until my velocity equals that of the train. And while it's applying that force, the force is in the same direction that the train is moving. However, if I jump down onto the train and it's frictionless there, then there will be no force. Instead, I will just slide off of the train. So let's consider rotation. Suppose I'm standing above a merry-go-round and the merry-go-round is spinning. If I jump down onto the merry-go-round and grab a hold, then the merry-go-round applies a torque to me until my spin is the same as the merry-go-round. There's also a centrifugal force if I'm not exactly in the center. The centrifugal force only appears in a rotating frame of reference, which this is. Uh, but that's not important. The key here is about the spin and the torque that that causes when I'm holding on to an object that is spinning. If I instead were to jump down onto the merry-go-round and land on a turntable that was frictionless, but its upper and lower surfaces didn't slip, uh, like the lower surface doesn't slip against the merry-go-round, the upper surface doesn't slip against my feet, then I will stay on the merry-go-round, but there's no torque. I do not have to spin with the merry-go-round if there's no way for the torque to be transmitted through this turntable. Okay. And then as we apply this to the Earth, if I'm standing on the Earth, the Earth is spinning about its axis. If somehow I am not, at the moment, spinning at the same speed and direction as the Earth, but I grab a hold of the Earth, then the Earth will apply a torque to me until my spin does equal that of the Earth. All right, now let's talk about the gyro compass. So here's my schematic view of the gyro compass that I built. There's a water bath that the boat is floating in. The axis of the flywheel is attached to the boat. The flywheel can spin around that axis. The entire boat can freely turn in the horizontal plane. And I've indicated here with the red arrow the spin axis, again using the right hand rule. So let's suppose that the spin axis is pointed west, as it was at the beginning of the video that I just showed. Well, the Earth is rotating around an axis 
through celestial north. That's approximately the direction of the star Polaris. There's a component of that spin that is up, the local up in, in the northern hemisphere. And there's a component of the spin that is aligned with local geographic north. Those, uh, the angle here of the spin axis is 38 degrees. That's because I'm at 38 degrees north latitude. But when we decompose the rotation in this way, we can we see that we can ignore the local upspin because the boat is decoupled from the upspin of the Earth due to the water. It can freely spin around in the horizontal plane. So the only thing that the boat feels is the spin around local geographic north, that component of the Earth's spin. So let's look at that. Let's look at the boat from above. The flywheel is spinning west, or that's its spin axis, as pointed west. The Earth has a spin around geographic north, that's the only component that's able to affect the boat. Well, this object is not, the flywheel is not spinning the same as the Earth, so the Earth applies a torque uh, on the spin axis, and the direction of the torque is geographic north. As we just saw, spin follows torque. So the spin axis of the gyro will precess toward north in order to align itself with the torque it feels due to the Earth's spin. Now, as before, we can analyze this not in terms of spin and torque vectors, but in terms of individual elements. So let's do that as well. So once again, we've got the flywheel its axis is pointed west. And we're going to imagine for the moment that the flywheel tries to stay with its axis pointed west. So what has to happen here? Well, this whole apparatus is firmly attached to the Earth. The Earth is rotating about north. So over time, the orientation of this apparatus must change. The west side has to go up the east side has to go down. The top has to go to the right, to the east, and the bottom has to go to the west. So if the orientation of the flywheel is changing over time, that must be due to a force. There's a force on the top element of the flywheel that's pointed east, and that is what, is, what would cause, if it didn't change its orientation, tilt over. That is, if, if the spin axis continued to point west, then the flywheel would simply tilt over toward the east in order to keep track of the Earth. So there must be a force on the top element of the flywheel pointing east. But the top element of the flywheel is moving north because it's spinning. So even though there's an eastward force, it can't respond to that immediately and start instantly moving east. Instead, continues to move north with an eastward deflection. But if the top of the flywheel is now traveling northeast, the spin axis must be deflecting toward the north. We can do the same analysis if the spin axis is currently pointed east. Once again, there's a force on the top element of the flywheel trying to tilt it over toward the east, so that's an eastward force. This time the top element is moving south, so it deflects east once again, but now that's southeast. The eastward deflection of the top of the flywheel causes the spin axis to deflect to the north. So whether the axis is pointed west or east, it will deflect toward the north as a result of the torque being applied about geographic north. Now I want to consider one alternative hypothesis for the motion that was observed in the video. Specifically, could it be that when I turned on the motor, in addition to causing the flywheel to spin, which would behave as a gyro compass, could it be that the magnetic field of the motor changed, and that that 
could explain part or even all of the motion that was observed. Well, to test that hypothesis, I took advantage of the fact that my cell phone, a Galaxy S7 if that matters, contains magnetometers. Most smartphones these days contain magnetometers. So I wrote a little program that just samples the magnetometers on the phone continuously, and I put the phone next to the motor. And you can see here on the screen the results of that experiment. So at the very left edge, the values shown there are what the cell phone reports for the geomagnetic field. And then it waves around a little bit because I was orienting the phone. I was holding it in my hand and moving it toward the motor. I then placed it next to the motor about half a centimeter away from the motor and let it sit for around 10 seconds with the phone not moving and the motor off. At 24 seconds, about approximately, I turned on the motor and I let the phone just sit there where it was with the motor running. And then at 60 seconds, I turned off the motor and again, I let, let the phone just sit there while the motor spun down. And finally, I picked up the phone and then turned off the recording application. So you can see that in fact, the magnetic field does change a little bit when the motor is running. Uh, gently trended a, a few percent perhaps over roughly 35 seconds that it was on. But this is nowhere near enough change to uh, affect the preferred orientation and certainly not to the degree that we saw in the experiment. So it's possible that there's some, some magnetic component to the observed motion, but it's certainly not the first order effect. So in conclusion, uh, you can build a gyro compass pretty easily. You just need a motor, a flywheel, and some kind of a boat. The only tricky bit is that typical motors have magnets in them, and that needs, that needs to be counterbalanced with some additional permanent magnets to try to get the aggregate magnetic torque near zero. In my case, it was not perfect, but it was close enough that you saw a pretty big effect. You can also use more exotic techniques like magnetic shielding. The gyro compass effect is caused by the precession due to an external torque. That torque is caused by the Earth because it is a passenger on Earth.